testing. Good morning, Bethany Church family and friends. We welcome you into the house of God this morning. Those of you that are viewing us by Facebook and Zoom, we thank God that you are Zooming in to us. Are you glad to be in the house of God this morning? Yes, we are. Amen, amen. With so much going on in the world, we're here today. So many people didn't see the sunrise this morning. We are so blessed with so many blessings that God has bestowed upon us, amen. We know that God is the God of comfort, and I'm going to read a scripture this morning out of 2 Corinthians 1, beginning with verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and of God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any afflictions with the comfort which which ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in God, Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for all. And I wanted to read that because Pastor and I was sharing some things last week about suffering. You know, many of us are going through some things that we're suffering, whether it's a loss of loved ones, whether it's someone that is bound by an illness, and we're believing for God's grace and mercy. And we don't understand why some things happen to some and some things don't happen to people, but we know that God is no respecter of person. What he'll do for one, he'll do for others. And all our responsibility is to pray. It's not our responsibility to question why, but even though we're human, we do question why we're going through something, right? Amen, if you tell the truth about it, right? Amen, come on, let's not have a deliverance service this morning. But we are so grateful that we sit here, amen. So today, our missionary, our Jews for Christ this morning, are the, are in our announcements this morning, uh, are there any announcements this morning other than what is on the bulletin? Do we have any announcements? Yes, Barbara, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. All right. Okay, happy 4th of July. Thank you for playing patriotic music. Give us another song at the end so we can, you know. Okay, you know our friend Paul Maury? Remember Paul? Okay, you know how he's leading the primetime band? They're so good. It's like 40 to 90-year-olds. Anyway, they're doing a 4th of July concert at the Santa Barbara Sunken Gardens, July 4th, 5 to 6.30. Go if you want. Bring a blanket. Bring your chair. That's super exciting, you know? Amen. Yes, and as we, pr as we begin to pray, we will pray for the 4th of July we sit here because we thank God for those that have served those that are serving now because we sit here free today because someone paid the ultimate price for us. Amen. Are there any praise reports? No praise reports at all. Amen. Are there any other announcements that we don't know about or that you like to pray for? Pastors, no one else. So as we begin to pray, I will ask if you'd like to stand, you can kneel. 
whatever you're comfortable with. And those that are watching us, God will meet you right where you're at in your living room, bedroom, wherever, as you just prepare your hearts for prayer. So let us prepare our hearts for prayer right now. And Father God, we welcome the spirit of the Holy Spirit this morning. We thank you that we are blessed people. We thank you that we are a blessed nation. And Father, we praise you for all of your goodness and your blessings and your mercy upon us. We pray for the Jews, your Jews for Jesus, the missionaries. We pray for all missionaries across the world and across the nation. The persecuted church, Lord God, open doors, Lord God, those that we don't even think about, Lord God, but we lift them up as they're carrying the gospel to the four corners of the world. All those, those islands and those places that we don't even know that exist, Father God. But we thank you for our missionaries, Lord God. We thank you for our nation, Father God. We thank you for, we pray for the wind of the Holy Spirit to blow across our nation because this nation needs God. The answer to the problem is not the president of the United States. It's not any election uh, 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 person. It is you, Father God. And we have to put our trust and our anchor in you, almighty God, because you are our fortress, you are our God, and we put our trust in you because our soul, my God, is anchored in you. And Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you would meet those in our congregation that need a touch of your healing power. Father God, those that are not in the congregation that need a touch of healing. Father, we pray for those that are incarcerated, not only in the jails, but in the four walls, Lord God, of our minds, our emotions, whatever it may be, Lord God. We thank you, Father God, for those that are bellowing depression, Lord God, that you would meet them, Lord God, at the point of their need, Lord God. Father, we all may sit here today that meet a touch from you somehow, a refreshing. We pray for the wind of the Holy Spirit to fall afresh upon us from the crowns of our head throughout our body to the very tips of our toes, Lord God. Father, we only pray, we pray for the 4th of July, our nation. We pray for those that are traveling on the highways this morning are already gone. We pray for those that are leaving today, going to Mount Hermon. We pray for their safety. We pray for Agnes and Bob that are on their way. Father, may they be refreshed. May they be come back renewed and refreshed by the word of God. That's all that's going to go forth, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, we pray for our prodigal sons and daughters, Father God, that's out there, Lord God, that you would compel them in the name of Jesus to come back to contact family, sibling, Lord God. But, Father, that you would set someone in their path with the love of God that will show them to tell them that they are loved, they are in pouring, Lord God. And we thank God for the power of forgiveness, Lord God. We choose to forgive. Lord God, teach us how to forgive like you forgive. Teach us how to love like you love, Lord God. Teach us how to walk like you do, Lord God. Father, teach us, Lord God, your ways, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, Father, we pray for our tithes and our offering that you may multiply them for your glory. Father, we pray our Father who art in heaven, how to be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done here on earth 
as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread as we forgive those that lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In Jesus' name, God's people say amen, amen. You may stand and greet one another as the worship team come. In Jesus' name. Well, good morning, everyone, and happy July 4th weekend to you. We're going to start off with the Battle Hymn of the Republic, also known as Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory. I'm going to share a little bit about this song in my message today. Uh, but it was written by a lady in 1862 and uh, during the Civil War as a battle cry to free the slaves in the south but you notice the words are really taken from revelation about the second coming of christ so let's sing mine eyes have seen the glory mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the lord he is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. circling camps they have filled with him an altar in the evening dews and damps i have read his righteous sentence by his dim and flaring lamp his day is marching on glory glory hallelujah glory glory sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat he is sifting up the hearts of men before his judgment seat oh be swift my soul to answer him be jubilant my feet our god is marching on glory glory hallelujah of the lilies christ was born across the sea with the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me as he died to make men holy let us live to make men free our god is marching on glory glory hallelujah glory glory truth is marching on his truth 
truth is marching on. Amen. His truth is marching on. And now from John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. all your failures bring your addictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross jesus is waiting there with open arms for god so loved the world that he gave us his one and only Son to save us, whoever believes in him will live forever. For power of hell forever defeated, now it is well. I'm walking in freedom, for God so loved, the, God so loved the world. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him, for His wonders of His love. Praise God, praise God. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated, now it is well. I'm walking in freedom, for God so loved, God so loved the world. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. Amen. He still loves the world. And besides uh, freedom that we have on July 4th, our theme today is unity. So we're singing one voice. We'll sing the first verse in uh, Japanese and then we'll sing two verses in English for one voice.
unity, that we could be one voice to the world, that our churches would not be divided and split and fighting amongst one another, but that we would be one voice declaring your praise and your glory and your gospel to all the world. May it be in our lifetime. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your loud voices. Please have a seat. Praise God. Thank God for our worship this morning. Amen. 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 And yes, we need unity among one another and unity in this world. Amen. So our scripture reading this morning is from 2 Timothy 2, verses 23 through 26. I'm going to ask you to stand out of respect for the reading of God's word, if you're able to. Amen. 
ready. Having nothing to Ready? <laughs> Having nothing to do with foolish, ignorance, controversies, you know that they breed. And the Lord servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their sense and escape from the snarl of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Thank God for the reading of his word as pastor come, and after the service, pastor and I We'll be up here for prayer for anyone that would like prayer or unknown prayer requests. Amen. Thank you, Amina. And good morning again. <clears throat> this is a challenging message. Uh, been thinking about for a long time about Christians and politics. So I thought I better lighten the mood a little bit and uh, start with a couple of jokes. Well, first of all, you know, Calvin, Calvin and Hobbes uh, was on your uh, bulletin with the verse for today, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and be patient with difficult people. I know you don't encounter any difficult people in your lives, but just in case you do, someday, uh, start off with a few political jokes. Everybody likes to poke fun at politicians, right? So we don't approve of political jokes We've seen too many of them get elected. Uh, there's no politicians in here, are there? No. The opposite of pro is con, so the opposite of progress must be Congress. <clears throat> That's bad. And conversation, a uh, man said, two years ago, my brother ran for Congress. His friend says, well, what does he do now? Nothing. He got elected. <laughs> so. <clears throat> All right. Now, <laughs> uh, why is it important to talk about Christian and politics? It's not even an election year, although it seems like it is. That's all you hear about. Uh, Japan was so nice, there's only like a two-week-long time of campaigning and then the election and then it was over. No. We got to go two years worth of campaigning, it seems like. But the biggest danger to the church right now is not politicians, it's not atheists, not the government, it's not LGBTQ community or communists or Nazis or anything else like that. The biggest danger to the church is division. And politics, unfortunately, has divided the church. The second biggest danger, I think, in the church is compromising the truth in order to try to conform to the world. But that's another message that I'll save for the future. But right now, politics has divided the church. And I'm talking about the worldwide community of believers, politics has caused Christians to even hate each other rather than love each other. Um, unfortunately, Christians involved in politics has actually caused the church to shrink rather than grow. And instead of making disciples of Christ, some, some Christians are trying to make disciples of politicians. And 
So just a little bit of history. Um, from the 50s and 60s, back in the 60s, about 50% of Americans were Democrat, 25% Republican, and 25% Independent. And then as Southern Democrats switched to Republican Party over the 70s and 80s, it became almost an even split, 33% each of Democrat, Republican, and Independent. Uh, the latest surveys that I could come up with for this year is uh, they vary a little bit from survey to survey, but around 27 to 30% each identifies Republican or Democrat and 41% as independent or no party. So the number, the number of no party or independents keeps growing and the number registered in the Republican Democrats keeps decreasing. <clears throat> The vast majority of Americans are in the middle. They're either somewhat liberal thinking Republicans or somewhat conservative thinking Democrats, but the majority of Americans are in that middle. But the problem is parties have been taken over by extremists on both sides. And <clears throat> as the extremists uh, take over the parties, then more and more people feel like the party's not speaking for them, and so they're leaving, leaving the parties. But the way our government is set up, it's really hard to get elected if you're not part of one of the parties. So I looked at four different passages that kind of parallel uh, the ideas, and I see about four, four um, principles that we can take from those. But first, I wanted to talk a little bit about some misconceptions. And one has to do with the song we sang. Um, celebrating July 4th, uh, the Battle Hymn of the Republic is considered a patriotic song. But it's, it's really a song about the second coming of Christ. But it was written for Union soldiers during the Civil War to kind of inspire them that they were they were doing God's work in battling to free the slaves. Uh, and I'm sure you remember the most famous line from the uh, Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When I, I studied a little bit about the Battle Hymn of the Republic, um, it was written by Julia Ward Howe in 1862. And there was actually another verse in there that I had not heard before, but it comes out of Genesis 3. Uh, and these are the words, I've read a fiery gospel writ in burnished rows of steel. As ye deal with my condemners, so with you my grace shall deal. Let the hero born of woman crush the serpent with his heel, since God is marching on. I thought that was a very interesting verse from uh, the original uh, score that she wrote. Now the reason I bring it up is just to remind us that verses 1 and 3 come from Revelation. Uh, sorry, verse 1. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He's trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. His, he hath loosed the light, faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. And then verse 3. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men, his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. So both of those verses are talking about the second coming of Christ. And the thing we have to be careful about is not thinking that God is calling us to be those warriors carrying swords. Uh, that's for when the Lord comes back. The Lord has called us to spiritual warfare, not, not physical warfare. 
because uh, our enemies are not flesh and blood. Even though we think, you know, we watch the news and we watch these protests and people want to try to drown Christian voices in the schools and things. Really, our battle is against the spiritual forces of darkness that are behind the flesh and blood. And we just have to be careful that Christians don't come across as this militaristic, you know, like crusaders of the past. Because awful, awful atrocities were done in the name of Christianity, you know, by, by the crusaders. And we don't want to fall into that thinking that we have to take our country for Jesus no matter what. Um, America is not the new Israel. Uh, America, America doesn't have a special covenant with God like Israel does. Um, God has a covenant with us, the church. We are the shining city on the hill. It's not, not America. Uh, we can't legislate people into the kingdom. Of course, we can legislate freedom and justice, and we should work to let, try to uh, put in legislation for living up to what the Declaration of Independence said, that all men would be created equal and have equal justice. But our main goal is not to fill the government with Christians and put in a Christian mandate in America. Our main goal is to build the church, to win people to Jesus, and not to win elections. So uh, another misconception is we think that all Christians should believe the same thing about the issues and about politicians. It always amazes me when I meet, meet another Christian who just can't believe that I have a different opinion on some issue that they do. Uh, well, all these Christians will all be thinking the same thing. Well, I've, I've got uh, a dozen issues here that um, I'll just show that I know Christians are on both sides of these issues. Now, there's one issue, abortion, that almost all Christians agree on, that abortion is not God's will. Abortion is sin. But Christians still disagree on, well, what should the law be? What should the penalties be? I mean, um, most Christians don't say you should execute a woman if she has an abortion, right? But from that extreme to the other, that there shouldn't be any laws, you know, there's varying opinions by Christians on what, what should actually be the law and what should be the penalties. And should there be six months, 12 months, 15 months? Uh, before you have clear-cut restriction. Christians vary on that. And we shouldn't let our fighting about an issue divide the church. Um, and I just want to share other issues that Christians have varying is uh, opinions on. Um, immigration, gun rights, versus gun control, universal health care, increasing taxes on the wealthy, lobbying and campaign donation and rules, environmental laws, and then uh, six more here, federal voting rights legislation, uh, religious symbols and government buildings, schools, school books that teach the history of racism in America, military spending, foreign relations, alliances, tariffs, and free trade. These are all things that Christians can go either way on. So the question is, how should Christians deal with other Christians on issues like these? How should Christians deal with non-Christians on issues like these? Should Christians run for office? Should Christians join a political party? Should the church endorse a political party or a political candidate? So I just want to look at these four passages with you briefly and then try to answer those questions, give you my opinion on those questions. So first of all, um, like I said, I got 
uh, these principles from these four passages that all deal either with our relations with the government or our relations with uh, controversies and quarreling and uh, foolish, foolish and ignorant controversies, as one passage puts it. And I came up with these four principles, which I'll go into a little bit more detail. Be subject to governing authorities. Have nothing to do with foolish and ignorant controversies and quarrels. Be devoted to good works. Be kind, gentle, and courteous as you engage with others. <clears throat> so first of all, on the first point, be subject to governing authorities. These uh, three passages speak to that. Be subject to governing authorities. Pay your taxes. Everybody loves that one, right? <laughs> Give honor where honor is due. Those who resist will incur judgment from Romans 13. From Titus 3.1, submit to the rulers and authorities, being obedient, ready to do every good work. Remember, when Paul wrote these, they had some really evil emperors ruling the Roman Empire. Uh, and so... He wasn't talking about people like most of our presidents. I mean, he was talking about people more like Stalin and uh, uh, Putin, you know. And then uh, First Peter, be subject to every human institution for the Lord's sake. So, I mean, I immediately thought about the January 6th riots at the Capitol. And so far there's been over a thousand people have been arrested 485 have been convicted of various crimes and received sentences. And when a professing Christian is a part of a mob like that that's breaking into government buildings and beating on policemen with flagpoles, American flags, or Christian banners, I mean, it's just a blatant disobedience of God's word. Uh, it's fine to protest but we definitely are being disobedient if we are violently protesting in uh, the government. Now, there's, there are exceptions uh, in the Bible, um, like in the book of Daniel. You have the government, um, government ordering them to do idol worship, and they refuse to do that. They were ordered to not pray to any other god, and they continued to pray uh, to their god. And the same in uh, the book of Acts, when the disciples were told, you are not to be speaking about Jesus and his resurrection. And they said, we have to obey God rather than men. So whenever the government tells us to do something that's against God's word, we have to obey God's word. Uh, but otherwise, we are to submit to the authority of the government. And then point two is, uh-oh. Um, have nothing to do with foolish and ignorant controversies. There are a lot of foolish and ignorant controversies floating around on the Internet. Controversies like, the 2020 election was rigged and stolen, or the great replacement theory that Democrats are trying to replace the white race with immigrants, the conspiracy theories about UFOs and Area 51, uh, that the US government's made up of a deep state, made up of satanic pedophiles and cannibals. The mass shootings were just false flags to try and repeal the Second Amendment. And I've also had people call me at church, not, not people that are in our church, but someone who's outside the church telling me that the moon landing was faked and the earth is flat. Um, and uh, these verses tell us what to do about that have nothing to do with foolish and ignorant controversies because they breed quarrels. 
but speak evil of no one, avoid foolish controversies and quarrels over genealogies and the law because they're unprofitable and worthless. Give a person two warnings and then have nothing to do with them because they're warped, sinful, and self-condemned. So if I run into someone who is spreading what I feel are false or foolish controversies that shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't be concerned with in the church, um, I will give them warnings. And if they continue to ignore the warnings, then I will ask them to leave. And point three is, uh, yep, go back. Be devoted to good works. So two of these passages that deal with government and controversies mention being ready for every good work in Titus. Be devoted to good works. Titus especially mentions good works, I think, more than any other of Paul's letters. And then First Peter says, doing good for the community puts to silence the ignorance of foolish people. And Christians do a lot of good works in the world and in America, and unfortunately it gets very little news media attention. What usually gets attention is when there's a failure, when there's sexual immorality in a church or in a whole denomination or in a Catholic church. Whenever there's a controversy, then you see it in the news. But when Christians are building a hospital or they're volunteering in setting up rescue missions and setting up food pantries. You just don't usually see that in the news, but that's what we're called to do. And if we do enough of it, it will make a statement to the world. That's what Paul was trying to get at, that we need to be ready for good works. And Jesus said that in Matthew five, that our good works are a testimony. It's a light to the world about what Christians are really about. And so rather than fighting the government on um, certain issues, we probably would be better spending our energy on doing good works. And then the fourth one, be kind, gentle, and courteous as you engage with others. And we have to, we should be able to engage with each other in the church. Um, I don't think we should spend sermons talking about those 12 issues like taxes and foreign relations and um, Medic Medicare and all that. Uh, but Christians should be able to sit down. We could have a small group discussion. We should be able to talk to each other without getting angry, without screaming and without dividing. And because most of us agree on the, the basic principles involved, whether it's helping helping immigrants, but okay, but what, what should the law be? How many immigrants and what's the qualification? You know, there are different, different things to consider, but we all agree that we're supposed to love the aliens, that's in the Bible. And so we should be able to sit down and talk and agree to disagree agreeably. And so we shouldn't be quarrelsome, but kind to one another, whether Christian or non-Christian. But especially with non-Christians, when we talk, we should be able to teach and, and give them examples from the word and principles from the word to support our argument or our position. And remind the brethren to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, show perfect courtesy toward all people. Live as free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor, is what Peter said. And unfortunately, there's so much name-calling and misinformation on the Internet and in the news. Um, and these generalizations that are... Uh, way, way too extreme. 
about the uh, political parties. Now, you've probably heard, probably heard some politicians say Democrats are all godless socialists who want to flood the nation with immigrants, or Republicans are all ignorant racists and just they're only concerned about preserving money for the wealthy. Uh, or Republicans are like Pharisees, they preach about morality, but behind the, behind the scenes they're totally corrupt, breaking the law. And Democrats are like Sadducees, they talk about God, but there's no real, no real belief in power. These are generalizations that when you, when you say something like that, you're saying that about fellow Christians because there's Christian Democrats and there's Christian Republicans. And if you go into a black church in L.A., um, you're going to hear a lot different message about politics than what you're going to hear if you go to, uh, let's just say, a white evangelical church in, in Southern California. And it shouldn't be that way. Our churches should all be purple. Um, you should be able to feel totally at ease and comfortable worshiping in a church, whether you're Democrat or Republican or independent or whatever. And we should be able to be unified around Christ and not worry about being unified around a party or a politician. And you just got to be so careful about making generalizations because when you do that, you are calling somewhere another Christian. You're, you're labeling them that way. So answer my first question, how should Christians deal with non-Christians or fellow Christians about issues? Um, I think it's on the next slide. Yeah, we have to agree to disagree agreeably. Be kind to everyone, not quarrelsome, able to teach our position with gentleness, kindness, and patience, to be meek and courteous to all people, and that means we listen without interrupting. Uh, sometimes hard for us to do, especially if you're being attacked, you want to jump right in. And I mean, I, I get so tired of watching... Uh, newscasts when people are just jumping in on each other guys trying to answer a question and then the then the uh, guy on the show just cuts in on them and uh, we need to listen to each other and and uh, have the courtesy to listen without interrupting and then not label people uh, or name call then should Christians join a political party well my opinion is it's better not to, but it's up to you. There's nothing in, I can't say, God says don't, don't register with a political party. The problem, the problem is if you say I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat, then people have this image of what you believe and what you stand for, even though maybe you only stand for half of what the, that party says they support. So... If you're going to run for office, should a Christian run for office? I think we need more Christians in government, local, especially local government, but all the way up to president. Uh, the more Christians we can get in, the better. But uh, ideally, to me, it would be to run as an independent. But independents have a hard time. So if you run as, join one of the parties then my recommendation is if you join a party to run that you be honest with people and say this, these are the party positions that I support and these are ones that I have a problem with. Um, and don't just say, oh, yeah, whatever the party says, I'm going to just vote up and down the line, whatever they say. Um, but that makes it tougher to win a primary. Uh, but I think we have to stand true to our our values and our beliefs, even if it costs us an election. And so by the same token, I'm sure you aware by now that I would not endorse a party or a political candidate from the pulpit. Um, 
I would say 99% of the time, the church should not endorse a party or a candidate. Um, even if one of our elders ran for office, um, I would not endorse him from the pulpit because he might have some opinions that I don't agree with, or she, and, um, and the other candidate might have some opinions that I do agree with. And it would not be worth dividing the church over even one of our own people running for office. So that's, that's my opinion. Um, maintaining unity of the church and being a testimony that we support Jesus, that we all support Jesus, and we have varying opinions on other things is, to me, the best testimony that we can have. Now, one, one exception, I mean, if one of our elders is running and the opposing person is like a Hitler or something, says, says he's going to shut down all the churches as if he gets elected or he's going to make all this one people group leave America or something. I mean, if something truly radical of a person like that would ever be running for office, then that, to me, that's the 1% time that we need to speak out like the churches in Germany that spoke against Hitler um, but I think I hope and pray we're, we're a long ways from that in America so the bottom line to me is we need to remember what our real mandate is from the Lord to be witnesses to all the nations, this is from Acts 1.8, to make disciples of all the nations, Matthew 28, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and love our neighbors as ourselves, Matthew 22, to love our fellow believers as Jesus loved us. And he said it was a new commandment, so it's different from just love your neighbor as yourself. He says love each other as I've loved you. Jesus loved us way beyond just normal love. He loved us sacrificially. He served. He washed feet. He died for us on the cross. Um, he was humble. He was forgiving. He's graceful. And that's what he's calling us to be with each other and to be unified as a church. His entire prayer in John 17 was focused on, may they be one, like we sang. May they be one as the Father and Jesus are one. He wants us to be one with Jesus and with the Father. He also wants us to experience his joy and to see his glory. That was his prayer in John 17. And so it's fine to get involved in politics. I encourage you to talk with each other about things you disagree on, but do it agreeably, because that's a real testimony. If we could show the world that we have Republicans, Democrats, and independents worshiping together and loving each other despite differences in opinion, on politics, I think that'd be a huge testimony to the world. And so, if you can be involved in politics and do all those things, I say go for it, um, have fun. Uh, it doesn't look like fun to me <laughs> to be involved in politics, but uh, those are my those are my uh, thoughts from what. The word has taught me, and if you would like to disagree with me agreeably uh, afterwards, I'm happy to talk with you, and uh, let's pray. Father, such a difficult topic and balance between serving you, serving the authorities in the country you place us in, and I especially think of brothers and sisters in very difficult countries that uh, are totally 
under the rule of Buddhism, Hinduism, or Islam. And Lord, we are so blessed. We have so much freedom here. I thank you for that. And I pray for our brothers and sisters around the world that they can survive and thrive and that you will build your church despite the persecution and pain that they go through. And Lord, I pray you'd give us wisdom. I pray that we would not be dividing over worldly issues, but would be united over biblical issues and would be united in our support of the church and of you. And Lord, I, I just pray you'll give us all wisdom and that we would be a, a testimony to you in our daily walk. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, if uh, praise team can come back up, we will sing one more. Jesus. If you can stand and sing with us.
to heal now. With the power to heal and the grace to forgive. I believe in you, Lord. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died. I believe you paid for us all. And I believe you are here now. I believe that you're here, standing in our midst, here with the power to heal now. With the power to heal and the grace to forgive. The scheduled doxology is Praise the Name of Jesus. And I'd like to sing that. And But before we do, um, why don't we sing the chorus of uh, one voice one more time? Uh, let us be one voice. Let us be one voice that glorifies your name. Let us be one voice declaring that you reign. Let us be one voice in love and harmony. And we pray, O oh God, grant us unity. Now, praise the name of Jesus. Okay. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer. In him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen. Amen. If you would like prayer, please come forward and we'd be glad to pray for you. Or if you're interested in baptism or membership, Please.